Attention listeners, ahead are spoilers. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Movie Trap. Uh, my name is Russell Carlson, and with me as always, Chris Boroff. Enter the Martini Castle. <laughs> and I am also joined by Zach Bauer. Merry Christmas, Movie Trap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like shooting of our movie, we're shooting this in, the, in, in a more warmer climate. Um, so... Uh, on the movie trap, in case you've missed us from before, welcome. One person picks a theme, and each of the three of us uh, picks a movie based on that theme. Each host share, starts with 10 points to allocate at the end, uh, but we have some bonus points that we issue out throughout the round. Uh, once we've watched all three movies, we use all the points we've allocated to vote on which of the movie was our favorite, and whoever host picked that movie gets to pick the next theme. You find yourself at the threshold of a new theme and the end of a closing theme. It is the most wonderful time of year. Previously on the movie trap, we were in the middle of my theme, which was ubiquitous movies that you have not seen, movies that everybody has seen, but you have somehow missed. Uh, we were watching Zach Powers picks Say Anything. And this time, it was Borov's choice. And if you're a long listener to the podcast, you know that this theme was almost invented for Borif uh, to run away with it. <laughs> and uh, he certainly did that because he has chosen 1946's Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, real quick, before we get into the nitty gritty and the wondrous, miraculous deus ex machina of Clarence's bureaucratic struggles in heaven, uh, let's get through our own bureaucratic struggles. So, as I said, we had points to issue at the end of this round to vote on which one will uh, pick the next theme. As of now, Chris Boreff, you have 13 points with no more bonus points to give out. I myself have 11 points with also no more bonus points to give out. And Zach Powers, you are sitting mightily at 14 points with one bonus point to give out. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but yes, it's a wonderful life, Zach. I know it will give you no small pleasure to summarize this movie, so why don't you go ahead and lay it on us? Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life is a 1946 film starring Jimmy Stewart and Donna Reed, uh, as well as Lionel Barrymore. Um, the basic gist of this movie, if you haven't seen it, I think most people have at this point, but uh, <laughs> Chris clearly had, so theoretically some of our listeners haven't. It was the first time. And I, uh, I'd personally recommend, hey, go go watch it. It's, this was worth checking out. Um, but uh, but basically, the film opens with a great number of people praying uh, to help to God to help uh, a man named George Bailey, who is having uh, a, his critical night, as it were. And uh, heaven responds by assigning an angel named Clarence Oddbody to come down and be his guardian angel for the evening. But before he can do that, he has to become familiar with George's life. And the bulk of the movie is uh, a flashback of what led George Bailey to to the worst night of his life, basically. Um, so a number of important events are shown. Uh, they start early in his childhood. He saves his brother from a sledding accident at the cost of hearing in one of his ears. And uh, later he uh, prevents his employer... Uh, a Mr. Gower, whose son has just been killed by the flu. Uh, and in his, his uh, you know, depression and grief, he accidentally put the wrong thing into some of the pills he was sending out to one of his patients. George he catches a mistake. Too. Yeah, yeah, and he, and he, he was went, drunk as hell because his yeah, son he, died. Yeah, he went on a sad stupor. That man had definitely been dipping into some of the cold NyQuil or whatever was going on. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, but George caught his mistake and... Uh, uh, decided not to deliver the pills, saving Mr. Gower from accidentally poisoning uh, a young boy. Um, uh, years later, uh, he is now uh, several years out of uh, high school. He'd be about 22 at this point. The year is 1928, and George is prepping to take a spin around the world. His lifelong dream is to have a life full of excitement and movement to see the entire world and to shake the dust of the crappy little town, upstate New York town of Bedford Falls, 
off of his shoes. Um, and he is on the verge of that trip, that dream coming uh, a reality uh, before he heads to college in the fall. Um, so he spends that evening uh, going to his younger brother's uh, prom um, where he runs into uh, Mary, who is a girl he's known, you know, on and off all of his life. Obviously, they live in the same small town. She's had a crush on him since as long as she can remember. Um, and they have a sort of a romantic uh, evening where uh, they fall into this indoor pool along with most of the class <laughs> and, uh, you know, walk home and sort of have this uh, romantic banter um, before. Yeah, that, their, that, that pool uh, their, was their just nice like night. an amazing moment, too. Yeah. Sorry. It's, uh, it's just the, it's a classic, the, the, it yeah, glitched it's, there for a second, but the. It's like an amazing feat of like engineering, how it like just peels back. It's amazing. Still there, yeah. apparently. Wow. Oh, nice. Opens and everything. Yeah, opens and everything. Uh, but their their romantic night is ruined um, by uh, by the news that George's father has had a stroke, um, and he passes away, scuttling George's uh, hopes to go on this this summer vacation before college. He has to stay behind and take care of his father's business and loan and prevent it from falling into the hands of Mr. Potter, uh, the richest man in town, a miser who wants to take control of basically every every aspect of Bedford Falls he possibly can. Um, ultimately, uh, when the final vote for what the fate of the building and loan will be comes up, um, George tells off Mr. Potter and his philosophy that people are good for nothing except making a buck off of. Um, and the board votes to keep the building and loan only if George stays behind and runs it himself. Um, so George's plans to go to college are, are through. He gives the money to his younger brother who goes in his place and he spends four more years in Bedford Falls. And four years later, when his brother returns from college, he's a married man. Uh, the deal was for him to take over the building and loan, but now his wife's father has offered him an excellent job at a glass factory. And George swallows uh, his dreams again uh, in service of his brother and lets him go uh, live his life elsewhere and stays at the till at the business and loan. Still, um, he meets Mary again, having sort of fallen out of touch with her after the death of his father. And uh, and again, after um, sort of another, uh, one of the most sexual, sexually tense scenes I've ever seen in any movie, um, they uh, <laughs> really? end up kissing and falling in love. Well, it's, I don't know if it's like, uh, I don't know. I think, I think that we'll get into that. We can get into that. Um, <laughs> My girlfriend definitely thinks the part where they're very close on the phone is one of the most, like, charged moments she's ever seen in anything. All right, we, we can address that as we get into it. I'll have to have an a explanation, but go ahead. Okay, uh, that's, you know, uh, she's not here, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Uh, regardless, um, regardless, they fall in love. They get married uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and decide to go on a, a, a honeymoon around the world. And wouldn't you know it, just as they're getting out of town, you know, it's the Depression, there's a run on the bank, um, you know, they've got all these people, and the building and loan will go under if they can't keep these customers from pulling all their money and selling their, uh, selling their debts to Potter at 50 cents on a dollar. So George goes into his own honeymoon money, and saves the building alone, giving away, you know, a ton of money in the process. Um, all of his honeymoon money. All of it, yeah. Uh, but that night, um, it's revealed that Mary has purchased the old dilapidated house in town for a song. And though it's going to need a lot of fixing up, at least they now have a home and a quiet place in Bedford Falls where they could spend their honeymoon that uh, Mary has spent all day putting together for them, along with Bert and Ernie, a couple of their friends. Uh, and time moves forward. George is again tempted by Potter, but rejects his offer to work for him. Uh, he becomes a family man, um, having several kids. And then the war comes, 
Uh, George can't go. He's got he's deaf in one ear from that incident when he was a kid. But his brother goes and becomes a war hero. And that brings us to uh, Christmas Eve, 1945. The war is over. Harry's coming home from his tour as a war hero. Um, everything. George is in good spirits. Uh, and, uh, he gives Uncle Billy, uh, the $8,000, the $8,000 end of year deposit to take down to the bank and Uncle Billy, while, uh, sort of sticking it to Potter, um, accidentally loses the money, handing it to Potter who steals it and keeps it for himself. Uh, the bank examiner uh, is there in town coincidentally. And if he finds out what's going on, likely they will go to jail for, uh, embezzlement or irresponsible big business practices, all of those things. And and this is over eight thousand uh, dollars, I believe. Correct. Correct, eight thousand dollars. And we could go in. I actually took some notes yeah, on what it, some it, of these there's sums probably are today. Some math. Okay, yeah. that would be uh, that would I, be I helpful. I figured you did, Zach. I figured yeah, good, you did. Good, I Zach. I have, I have I have notes on there's there's several sums that are mentioned in this movie that I can provide some some light on how much they would be today. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. So all he has now is this life insurance policy. He has a, a breakdown in front of his family. It's clear something is wrong. Uh, you know, he gets drunk and decides the only thing he can do is, is collect on this life insurance policy by killing himself. And so he goes uh, to the bridge in town with the intention of jumping in when Clarence shows up and jumps in first. He saves Clarence, who reveals he's his guardian angel. And, uh, you know, obviously George doesn't believe this and says, you know, maybe the best thing for everybody would have been if I had never been born, which gives Clarence the idea to show him what the world would be like had George Bailey never been born. And so they take a tour through what used to be Bedford Falls and is now called Pottersville because Potter has basically taken control of the town, all of the housing that he gave to all of the you know, the people in the town um, on good faith and low interest loans and things like that are gone. Everybody lives in a slum. Everybody's life is much worse. It's full of bars and strip clubs um, and casinos. Uh, basically, I, I got to say, downtown, knows, downtown looked like a lot more fun in the hell version. It looked that, like that town was popping uh, the second time through. But. All of his friends, you know, uh, <laughs> like the cab driver is living in the slums. His wife has left. You know, Martini doesn't own his bar. God knows what happened to him. Um, you know, Uncle Billy has been thrown into the Asaid Asylum years ago after the death of his father. Ma Bailey having no children left because obviously his brother died when he was a kid in the sledding ex uh, accident. It um his old you boss, know. Gower, is a, a drunk living on the streets because obviously yeah. he wasn't there to stop him from giving the woman the poison. Yeah. And Gower um, went to prison so, for years yeah. and years and years. Um, now he's homeless on the streets begging for money. Obviously, everybody uh, Harry would have saved in World War II died in the attack. And perhaps most horrifically... And Hitler survived! And, yeah. and, and, and we're all... <laughs> perhaps most horrifically, Mary has become an old maid. Um, a librarian. Yes. Yeah, it's it's crazy so that they think these... that like she she would have just become an old maid. Like we've seen her being beautiful the whole movie long, but we expect that like oh no yeah she would just totally not find someone else who'd be acceptable and just stay sprung on George, yeah. who didn't exist in this reality. <laughs> yes. uh, regardless, uh, yeah, he <laughs> decides after seeing all these horrors that he he wants to live. That he he understands the value of his life. And that wish is granted to him. He runs down the street in a euphoria, euphoria, screaming Merry Christmas to everybody. He heads home, willing to accept that he's going to go to prison, but happy that he's alive. Um, but little does he know, the entire town has come together to give everything they can back to George for all he's done for them. Uh, they dump tons of money on his table to, to get him out of the hole. And his old rich friend who moved to New York wires him $25,000 ensuring that uh, any financial votes he had have been served. The warrant for his arrest is torn up and uh, a bell rings implying Clarence successful in his mission has finally gotten his wings. And that is the story of it's a wonderful life. Had a boy Clarence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, 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 you know, it, it it's funny because if you'll notice in that whole um, summary, you know, like, 
we start out with the plot of Claret saving George, and then the whole movie happens. And then 30 minutes left in the movie, Clarence shows up and saves. And there's just sort of this weird. Yeah. The movie yeah. makes a, a turn into like this kind of tragic human story into like this sort of Christmas fairy tale. Basically. Yeah, I think Frank Capra um, famously said he didn't even really consider it a Christmas movie because the majority of the movie doesn't really take place on Christmas. Correct. Um, but yet the whole all the whole plot hinges on this sort of you know, Charles Dickens S Christmas Carol sort of story. In fact, uh, it's based uh, on a short story called the greatest gift, uh, by a man named yeah, Philip right. Van Doren Stern, right. uh, which yeah, he saw published and, in 43. And that in turn is loosely based on a Christmas Carol. Right. So and it, it, it's, it's also, clearly, I mean, like, yeah, a there's also a lot of, there's a lot of shit about like, even the screenplay. Cause this movie was kind of kicked around a lot too. And, and Capra kind of hijacked this script and this screenplay and this story. Um, and it's kind of funny too, because this is the first film that Capra did after the war. Because like, while Capra, I what wasn't on the front, he very much served. He was like, but FDR's propaganda. It's worth guy. noting, Jimmy Stewart did serve. He was a pilot yes, for fifteen he did. months, and this was yes, his he first did. movie after. Yes, he did, after and he it served. shows. Yeah, it, and he it was shows. dealing. It really does. There's a lot of accounts that he was dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder during this movie, I, which he didn't want to make. He didn't want to make a movie about a guy who wanted to kill himself. Right. Right. But he Neither needed Capra. to get his foot I, back in the door because he'd been gone for four years. I got to be honest. This movie was a little strange on some of that. It just because of like, with, since we're talking about the big twist where the angel shows up, uh, the thing is, is that watching it, I don't know what the angel changed in George's life effectively. Because people came together based off him being a good guy before. So the revelation George has is simply like, it's sort of like an incident in Owl Creek Bridge, the old Ambrose Beer story. You guys were referencing like the, it's the same, it's a similar story where he has this like revelry of like an imagined situation. And then at the end, there's the hard like turn back to reality. But the thing is, is like yeah. all the things he did that set it up were still going to happen. It was just that he emotionally was like, feeling bad about himself and then he had to kind of go through a a uh, self-worth like discovery it seemed yeah, like yeah exactly is, i think it is i mean th they didn't yeah clarence didn't come down and say like here's half a million dollars but this is a guy who spent his entire life even though he was doing great things for the people around him frustrated at the level of sacrifice he made the things he never did he felt like a failure in many ways and it culminated in this uh this attempted suicide, like the fact that they didn't protect him from theoretically going to prison is besides the point. It's about, I think, George understanding the value in and of himself and whether he goes to prison after that, as long as he lives and is a person who can understand. I, th I think it's more about the emotional well-being and not literally. It is, and it's. Yeah. And, it, and it's motivated by by George's desire to escape. You know, it's motivated by his desire to go on adventures and get out of this small town and, and go see the fucking world and stuff. And yet he's constantly pulled back in because he knows it's the right thing to do. He's constantly pulled back or he wants to with Mary. Like he, he loves and wants to be with Mary, but he also there's a lot of things he wants to do with his life before yes. he starts to become what his dad is, which was a job that drove him to an early grave. So with that in mind, the, the Clarence twist is, the, and it's the, it, it plays into the title of the movie. You already had a great life. You know, like you kept longing for this adventure in this grand world out here, but you've got a grand world right in your own backyard and it's of your own making and you're the best among them, George. Like that, that is valued by, that, he, that, it, that is a value that he hasn't obtained in the whole movie of his of knowing that what he was doing was the right thing and it's worth it to people. He always, you know, listened to his dad and and wanted to suspect that, but he never really knew it. And I think that's the point of the the magic stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm with you, Borf. I, I I had a feeling that the the dramatic gear shift into fairy tale land. <laughs> well, uh, after watching a pretty harrowing out of a man uh, through circumstances and his own actions is 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 a bit of a you know. It, I, I it get felt. It. It felt weird. The The reason I'm bringing it up is because it, like, in terms of, like, um, dramatic structure, 
This felt more to me like the angels at the start and all that were like a Greek chorus. And then they jumped ahead on that machine and then got down into the story to start setting things around. However, this one didn't turn into full deus ex machina because they didn't fix his problems. They just fixed his mental, his spiritual problem is what they fixed, not his like It's still a little problem. deus ex machina though. I mean, it's it's yeah. it, the, yes, the magic and... thing that happens that is is him revealing this alternate reality that that's yeah. a little twilight zone sure you know yeah yeah but again but it's I, not I something that think... changed the the functional thing like they didn't yank him off the bridge it's just that the angel jumped before correct. he did yeah yeah correct yeah i yeah i i, I mean yeah i i, I think it's fully work i don't feel like it's a it it is earned. It is not a cheap screenwriting trick. Trick they are going to tell. They tell you from the beginning that this shit could happen. Like I don't think Correct. it fails in the way Deus Ex Machina's traditionally do. Um, where they feel like part of the problem is where did this come from? Why was it like suddenly, suddenly nine to five has a fucking Deus Ex Machina, right? <laughs> For sure. One of yeah. my favorite Coen Brother movies, uh, The Hudsucker Proxy, has a very famous Deus Ex Machina. I'm not saying I'm against Deus Ex Machinas because sometimes they could be charming and fun. Um, this one is charming and fun because, again, they kind of did set it up with the whole stars talking and everything, and and yeah. so it that is a, that sort of set up. But then too. you do, sp- but then you spend the really a good healthy chunk of the movie not dealing with Clarence and the talking yeah. stars at all. Um, so that's where yeah. it does kind of feel like, yeah. oh, right. There was a whole beginning of this movie that that happened. Yeah, this is I, the story I, of an into- a man's most of it is the story of a man's entire life. Yeah. Yeah. I'd never yeah. seen that. Stars yeah, that's thing why before I, I, as like uh, angels. I thought that was a very neat sort of visual motif. I hadn't seen that done before. I guess everyone has seen that done before because they've seen this before. But it was first. For and, me. and I think. And apparently there were several drafts and, and scenes in this movie where there was a lot more sort of religious expression. Like there's a whole scene of George praying and reciting the Lord's Prayer and stuff like that. And Capra decided against it because he didn't want it to be overtly religious. He wanted yeah. it to be more emotional. Um, and I think it was a wise choice. Yeah, I don't um, think they ever mentioned I, Jesus in this film at all. I don't think no, the word they mentioned God quite a bit. They, they say God, God, but they never say Jesus. Himself. Like yeah, for a yeah. movie that ends with angels, it is fairly devoid of religious imagery. Barely. I mean, he would say he was, he was trying to combat atheism, which, again, it, after the war, you can kind of understand where there's this sort of deep, dark secret in everybody's head. There, there's a hopelessness to existence. Um, well, and they, I think that that's what Capra a, really wanted to try to attack. Yeah, You can kind of see the starts of like the anti-communist thing, because they usually attributed like atheism to communism, which is strange. But, sure. The but thing, this film, the thing they, about they that is, that this film was a little comedy. The FBI <laughs> thought this film was a communist propaganda film. Yeah, like that you can't say anything bad about the banks. <laughs> the speech he gives to Potter, like when, for instance, I think it, I think it comes off most strongly when he's like talking about how people deserve to work and live and die in a, in a good home, and like telling Potter yeah. that like this capitalist drive is bullshit and that the people are what matter. Like I think the FBI was like, this is some oh, yeah. commie shit. Oh, yeah, I had to no. go before the House of Un-American Activity. This is before Joe McCarthy was on there. Thank fucking God. Oh, that's um, hilarious. Because like it, it yeah, it it, 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 so it's, it's funny because it, the part of the reason is because you can't say anything bad about bankers, you know, pay, saying bad things about bankers is a communist trick to get you to hate capitalism. Like, well, the bankers really kind of do it themselves too, don't they? I mean, yeah, it was, it was they weird. They kind of that kind of shit in their critique. Yeah. It was weird that this had like a good guy banker in it with George, where he's like, oh, no, I'm a good guy. But at the same time, a lot of the I just had a hard time believing some of the small town values that came up in this, which are good values. I bought it for the sake of the story happening. But like if I go to the bank and I can't cash a check, I have a mild like meltdown and I've seen other people have a mild meltdown. I can't imagine that it wouldn't have ended with like a couple gunshots, maybe someone taking a <laughs> swing at George, a stabbing. Um, Such like when people cynic. were jumping in the when people were jumping in the pool, I straight up thought someone was going to break a tibia or like snap a clavicle or run <laughs> or jump into somebody else. You just want like <laughs> fucking the Snyder cut of It's a Wonderful Life. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want. I'm just saying, it looks scary. It looks scary. A motherfucking live, George Bailey. We live in a society, Zach. It's called Bedford Falls. <laughs> 
Uh, well, it's funny. That's it's funny. It, that's I, I. I wasn't going to bring this up, but when I was reading about this movie, um, I, I think somebody even wrote at the time that like the the Bedford Falls bit is the fantasy. Pottersville's the reality. Like it, what the angel showing him is the actual reality. Bedford Falls is this idyllic fantasy, and P- Pottersville is what the America we actually live in. Uh, I don't know. I just if I had a point, I would have given you one because that that made me think of that. And yeah, I mean, but it, I, it I wanted to say like downtown I, it, L.A. It's like the fun areas of downtown L.A. <laughs> like that aren't like completely overrun by homeless people. You know, there's pawn shops, there's liquor stores, there's dangerous looking places. It's the fun part of L.A. Yeah, I think that it's a fair bet. However, that Pottersville probably would have a pretty severe homeless problem. It seems like he puts people in slums and overcharges them for rent. For sure. I suspect there's a lot of like homelessness and deep, deep poverty. For sure. I, and I, I, um, I'm glad part of the reason that I think the, um, this movie had such a kind of weird fixation on the idyllic sort of small town values is Capra himself. I think that, after, I mean, like I said, he never actually served, but I mean, he was Hitler's propaganda and he did look over intelligence, meaning he did see the footage of Auschwitz and the GI. He made, so he, he made a, a series of propaganda, fil- propaganda films for America called the Greatest Gift series. Right. That's yeah. how he served. Yeah. Well, and, and but he was also, you, you know, it was him and the four other people. I think Willem Wyler and George Stevens. I think John Ford was in there too. And then, so he, he did see he was privy to some pretty gruesome footage that no, that wasn't really widely available to the public. And he kind of carried that in him. And that's why I think that, you know, Jimmy Stewart's performance obviously reflects this kind of PTSD, but I also think it's in the movie itself. Cause I, I think w- so too. When, 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 when Capra, the way that the lighting shifts, when he knocks over the model that he's building and everything else up until that movie, up until he meets Clarence, and even throughout the whole Pottersville fantasy, there's this real low, harsh light on him where the whole rest of the movie, it's been very much like a stage play, your classic 1940s sort of like melodrama. Um, but it's at that moment where you see this kind of shift and there's this very dark and tragic tone almost surrounding George, everything he does up until that point. It's Well, it, it yeah, reminded it's the- it reminded me of like, you know, whenever you have an authority figure at like Thanksgiving or Christmas who gets really upset for some reason and it surprises people. Like, I don't know if you guys have, hopefully you've never had that happen. But if you have like someone who's like a mate or patriarch of the family, like really lose their temper, it makes the whole room sort of seize. So I could kind of buy that. But it did seem strange that he never had to come back and really apologize to his family for like directly saying in front of his children that he regretted being a dad a little bit. That he was came strange... up and hugged him. Come on, Borov. What did you want? You want like here are the 10 reasons that I'm going to apology. I... <laughs> he's came back and he's he's saying I thank you for oh, whatever. I know. I know. Um, I know. But from everyone else's perspective, he, they didn't have the spiritual awakening he did. But they yeah. understand what happened to him by the end of the movie. Like, they understood right. that he was facing prison, that right. his life was in shambles, that he wasn't sure if he was going to, like, be able to see... Like, I think you can understand this guy's having a mental breakdown because he's facing a serious fucking... Like, if your dad was exactly. mean to you one day, mm-hmm. and then you found out the next day, oh, he's facing 20 years in prison, would you be like, Dad, you need to apologize? For I that, mean, how you were mean I, I when you get, were facing get, 20 years? I get all that, but we're also talking about toddlers, like very young children who don't understand business at all. So it's like coming back and saying, Dad had a bad day on the stock market. The kids don't understand what that means. <laughs> well, then they'll just have to carry that with them until an angel comes and saves them and reminds them of their well, own self-worth. There That's, you go. Thus, the perpetual cycle of theism continues. And the worst, so, um, I mean, the oldest kid probably understands. He told the other one to stop playing but I'll bet because definitely Susan mom understood. Shit. Donna Reed understood at that time, so she probably said, "Listen, kids, dad's in a bit yeah. of a spot. I'm gonna go first. I think what's more perplexing is who let the bank inspector and the cops in. If mom's out getting all the town and stuff, because she comes in and they're like, "Oh, hello! Like you're surprised you're here." Did the kids just like, "Oh, here, come on in. Would you like to open presents with us?" You know, like I don't know. <laughs> I um, think it is true. I think that this movie is. Yeah, it's interesting how this movie is kind of about. Uh, kind of about, you know, dealing with, in many ways, dealing with the war, even though the war is not something that Jimmy, and I think that's like, there's this weird way of not directly saying this is about the war. And, and, and there's a couple other times they do that. First, I want to say this, obviously in Capra's directing and Stewart's performance, you could see, I think like some very real 
like stuff they brought home. One of my favorite anecdotes I read about this is Stuart was considering quitting acting because he was finding it superficial after what he had done in the war. And Lionel Barrymore said to him, so it's more valuable to bomb people than to entertain them. And that changed Stuart's mind and made him decide to continue acting. That is a cool Um, story. But uh, interestingly, like, it's also there's other things that happen that are clearly analogous to things that happen in real life, like the Spanish flu thing, right? Early in Mm -hmm. the movie. Technically, the timing's like a year off for that. It should have been 1917, 1918 and not May of 1919 when the pandemic was pretty much over. But, you know, they say influenza, you can imply Spanish flu, but they don't really get into it. And the same with the Depression. There's a run on the bank, but they never say it's the Depression. There's a picture of Herbert Hoover. There's a run on the bank. That's it. That's as far as they go. And even that's a few years after Black Monday. So it seems like the run would have happened. But Uh, yeah, they pull their punches a little bit on some of the... They pull their punches a little bit on some of the more intense things. It's more to kind of give you the sense of it without actually dwelling is kind of the thing. Like, uh, that's why I uh, think Forrest this film does I, the same I, that's thing, why it, kind of. Well, but they hit the nail on the head, dude. I mean, they don't, they don't fucking, I mean, hide often, all, but I a mean, lot of the times they yeah. don't deal with the reality of like how it is to actually be a minority and they just show the Black Panthers as a joke scene. But well, other than that, like, that, that's, that's a similar that's thing. True. I mean, yeah, but there, and there's also, I think there's, you could, there's a clear affection that Capra has for FDR and mm-hmm. like, all the new deal sort of things and, and, you know, and particularly one Italian banker in California who the founder of bank of America, I guess, uh, who started opening up loans to middle-class Americans and not just wealthy people. Um, but also, I mean, that was sort of the problem, wasn't it? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, it, 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 I think that one of my favorite parts about this film and is that it is so in my opinion about the war and coming out of the war yeah than it actually says i and and, and, and in some ways it's about because we talked about the depression and and the spanish flu i think it's about an entire lifetime of american trauma yeah and you're dealing with people who did that's why that last scene is so crucial and then Seward plays it, it he's brilliant in it because you're having to now acclimate into civilian life. Every man has been out fighting overseas. Now they're home, you know, and they have to just pretend like, hey, it's Christmas, you know, like that. And without actually saying it, they never actually say it. And I think that that, that's what elevates this movie to the legendary status that it it rightly deserves. But also- even if you don't pick up on that at all, you're a kid, you watch, I think for a lot of people who don't pick up on that at all, it still works. For sure. Yeah, perfectly yeah. well, even if you it's completely a fun missed that Christmas fairy tale. Um, but also, uh, Borov, I I mentioned this when we uh, when we signed off on say anything, but it is the uh-huh. polar opposite of Citizen Kane. Um, I I really did have a seven page dissertation, which I will summarize now. Um, Citizen yeah, Kane pump, pump. versus Wonderful Life by Russell Carlson. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But though it. it it's interesting to compare those two movies because I guess both are like, widely how, considered. How do you see them? How do you see them different? Like, what what would you say is the extreme? How do I see them different? Difference? Yeah, yeah. What's the differences? Well, oh, they, the the differences that I see. Well, they both bookend the the war. You know, they Kane kind of came out right when Hitler was getting started. This kind of came out right when the war was kind of winding down. Um, the I think that it's Kane's tragedies the character not just in the not just in the 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 way wells and capra made it but in the character of charles foster kane versus george bailey charles foster kane's tragedies are manifested by his selfishness they are manifested by him wanting them to fit in boxes that he makes and that makes sense to him bailey's tragedy is his selflessness is his empathy he will constantly chip away at his own value and his own humanity for the per- goodness of others to the point where it destroys him almost. Um, I think that that's and also, but in production wise, I think Wells Wells was pushing visual boundaries at the time to emphasize character and world building that kind of thing. Capra really kind of lets the humanity speak for itself in this movie. In many cases, he kind of lets the kind of idyllic sort of fantasy yeah, it, it of felt play, it felt closer play like the sets out and yeah it and felt closer more like an hour town it kind of rests on its own yeah uh more than yeah. than well sends a trial attention to itself 
Um, sorry, I over talked. I mean, they're similar bit. too. I mean, they're they're similar too because like uh, both both Charles, they're both like stories, right? And they're both start with a congruence of faceless people saying well, how what happened to this man what what is going on with this person um, yeah i mean and, they start and they they're start both with that, kind of critiques of wealth and materialism they are but the thing is, is i would say that like while the story's main narrators or excuse me not narr- narrators the main protagonists have different endings and different ways they approach the question of um greed and morality uh both films are kind of driving home the same point that like greed over love is like uh deadly so you sure. know we never we never get the sense of this that the other bank manager is anything but hateful and lonely when he goes home at night if we if we got the sense that he somehow went home to a happy family and all that it would probably undercut the message so i think they're both kind of telling the same style of story um yeah. but uh it's funny that you say that i i would like we've gotten on the business thing a few times and zach teased this i would really like to know what are the actual numbers at play in this movie like because i have a number of numbers for you guys yeah because <laughs> okay, go ahead take we'll it away just it. tell me there's, tell a me. Other, there's a there's a there's a few other things we can talk about later but yeah let's do the numbers rundown because i have numbers for a lot of different points in this movie we'll just do this real quick first number the 1928 sequence when he balls out potter and potter said uh, he made ernie a house worth five thousand dollars right and he says you know how long it takes a man to to save up five thousand dollars, uh, well, that would be in today's money just under eighty thousand dollars. Holy that shit! Value. Yeah. Okay, so that, that's that quite is a the bit. amount of, and that's yeah. So that's the that's the amount that he lent Ernie for his home. The honeymoon <laughs> fund. It was two thousand dollars they took on this honeymoon. This is in nineteen thirty-two. Today, that would be under just under forty thousand dollars. Of which they end up with two dollars or about forty bucks at the end of the run in the bank. For a um, honeymoon, some of the amounts. Jesus, I know that's an ex- extreme honeymoon. That's fund. a lot. Uh, some they of the did amounts have big plans. So they were going to do a lot of traveling. Some of the amounts yeah. people took out. The guy who wanted his two hundred and forty-three dollars. That's four thousand seven hundred dollars. The one who wanted the people who wanted twenty dollars. That's about three hundred eighty-five dollars. And the woman who said seventeen fifty. That's about three forty. Um, that line was, I think, improvised, by the way, and Jimmy Stewart's reaction is real when he kisses her. Um, <laughs> so then we move on to 1934 or 35. It's unclear. Uh huh. At this point, Potter offers him a job. He says, right now, right now, Jimmy Stewart, you're making 45 a week. That's 880 a week or 2250 an hour or around 45,000 annually, which is not That's- bad. That's not bad. It's not a lot, though, for a guy who runs a bank. It's not a lot. It's not a lot, but it's not bad. I think it's a good number. It makes sense. He offers him a salary of $20,000 a year. That is $390,000 a year. That's $195 an hour is the the amount of money he offers him. Um, Yeah. Then we jump... That's weird. It you got to start asking serious questions about like I get that the hometown values are important, but at some point George really should have been looking out for those kids college fund. Like he's got four kids now and he's like passing up a real cushy gig. He does that gig for one year. He could probably pay for every child to go to the best college. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's So then we jump to 1945. Uh, Christmas time for these values because it was the end of the year I kind of went in between 1945 and 1946 values I found like the median 8,000 is the amount that uh, is the amount that is lost that comes today to $115,000 is what Uncle Billy lost holy shit okay how much is his life yeah his life insurance is worth $15,000 which means $210,000 $210,000 for his life insurance policy. Okay. The 500, that's, the, I mean, the that's equity a, on it was $500. That's $7,000. And finally, finally, Sam Wainwright authorizes them to wire him $25,000. That's $355,000 in today's money. <laughs> Yeehaw. <laughs> My God. And one, one, one more for one more for a bonus. Uh, Clarence says he's 293 next May. That puts his birth 
in May 1653, the same year as Paco Bell and 10 years after Isaac Newton. And he is 368 as of today. <laughs> but he's right. flying away. He's 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 <laughs> elevated to the more. So that's, to, he got himself a okay. desk job up in heaven. Those so are the numbers. The, the, the numbers all make more sense now, because when they were talking about it in the movie, I'm like, yeah, I know this means more than it was then, but I have no idea how much that means. So I don't know if this is a life ending or if this is just like, man, you got to work a couple extra weeks. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that it's that's a surprising amount of money. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, to, to go back to to sort of Capra here, I mean, like this is his own studio doing this. This is Liberty films that he set up with Will Weiler and George Stevens. This is one of the, one of the rare moments where a creative force bound together to make their own studio. It was distributed by RKO shot at RKO studios, but it was by all intents and purposes, a Liberty film, uh, sure. Liberty film made two movies, this one and another George Stevens movie. And that is it. It went belly up um, yeah. because it did yeah. not last long. Cause this movie itself, was not all that successful. Uh, was not all they 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 broke even or commercially. Yeah, yeah, it, it broke about even. It was nominated it for lost, Oscars. It even lost, but, it lost a small amount of money. Actually, I, I read. Yeah, it it, it yeah, yeah it, it it. I mean, this one's like an early. Yeah. This one's like an early example of since it went into the public domain later. I think it's a good early yep. example of the fact that it was cheap. And then people were able to appreciate it and revisit it more often. It's the same reason that we have... Um, yeah, it got, it got played the, on TV. Night of, yeah, Night of the Living Dead is the exact same thing because they screwed up the public domain yep. listing at the end of it so it was able to be played as much as people wanted. So I think that's one exactly. of the reasons it's great so successful. And they're, and they're great for holidays, right? Because you don't have to pay much. You just put it in, that's two hours. You know, you're, you're done. You, you don't but have I, to have much program. I'll say Because there's you, not uh, much programming. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, that, that this movie and the other one that Russell mentioned under the same contract, they're because of some weird clause, both of them got their trademark lost. Paramount owns this now, but you know, it it got its trademark lost for a while. Um, but also it was nominated despite being a financial flop, a critical mixed bag, nominated for 5 Oscars, including actor, director, and best feature, lost all 3 of those to best years of our lives. It won one Oscar for technical achievement for better snow, more mm -hmm. realistic snow. Hey, and when they're shooting in July, that looks pretty good. You know? well, it's, <laughs> it's interesting you guys are talking about it. You you specifically said how this one was kind of about the war without being about the war and the best years of our lives is like the most it's prime very example. It's very much. Yeah, exactly. William Wyler, too, who, who like Capra, served in sort of FDR's propaganda department. Um, you know, like, so it's, it's kind of funny that this movie, while... I, I, like I said, America just wasn't ready for this movie, man. They just weren't ready for it, you know. And then Christmas in the 70s happened, and well, you could plug it on, a, here's and the little ones go watch it, and no one will notice. I got a legitimate question for both of you, because this is one that people have talked about, um, and they love it, and it's, you know, a cultural icon and all that. We mentioned the thing about the public domain and how much it got replayed. Mm. Do you think it's considered a classic due to how it was released, or do you think this one stands on its own as a timeless classic without having any of the extra known facts or backstory uh, with the film. Do you want to, do you want to say first Russell? I, uh, I, I will never really know. Will we? I mean, it, it I think, well, this yes. is a personal choice. Do I say, you think I, say yes. yeah, this, I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. Um, just because it is such a, hopeful story and last i checked people really like those so yeah. i'm i'm going to say yes uh i'll say this uh about the movie uh which i didn't have like when i was a kid i didn't resonate with it as much and now i feel like every time i watch this movie i like it more than the last time i saw it like i think at this point and this is probably something that has happened in the past 3 to 5 years it's maybe one of my top 10 favorite movies and it's not 10 like I think this movie is great. I think it holds up on its own very, very well. I, I I'm inclined to agree with you because it it even when I watched it this time and I've seen it you know three or four times before because I didn't miss that day in film school, Borov. Um, well, but I, it 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 brings you to tears still. You feel bad yeah, for George. Yeah, it, you know? it gets me. Like the end really works on yeah. me. And and why, why I do think you think that, that change has happened for you? Stewart's uh, Stewart's 
I think Stewart has one of the best acting jobs in cinematic history in this movie. Sure. Sure. Um, why did that change for me? I don't know. I mean, maybe I just didn't understand as well when I was young, when I was a kid. Like, I think this movie is, I think this movie would be kind of boring to kids because they don't, like, there's so much to do with finance. <laughs> what are they going yeah. like, to get to the, the angel? Things, the... <laughs> yeah. the things about everyday life that, like, Paul, and being stuck, stuck in your hometown. Like, a kid doesn't yeah. really understand this thing of your life passing you by and you can't, your dreams fading away from you. Like, kids don't understand that. But, like, sure. adults get it. Like, you know how it feels to be George Bailey at least a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I totally get it. Absolutely. I was uh, surprised by the movie. I liked, um, I didn't expect George to kind of be a dick at the beginning of the movie a few times. Because I just remembered him after he's gone through the, oh my God, I love everyone. But when he was like back talking as a small child or uh, he he's incredibly he dismissive of Donna Reed's like original <laughs> dance partner. And it's like one of the, the, it's just like so harsh and so beautiful and it's so on point. That? <laughs> That dance partner, that dance partner, fun fact, the annoying dance partner who's telling her a story that he's bragging about and uh, opens the pool. Alfalfa from the Little Rascal shorts. <laughs> oh, my God. Actor. That makes sense. That's why he looked familiar. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, who died, died in the 50s over a gambling debt, was shot to death. Holy shit. Oh, wow. well, that's a that 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 was a roller coaster of a story. <laughs> I got excited and then sad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, I have some I have some other fun a few other fun trivia about this movie that I, that I, that, I, that I'll Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It, 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 but I I'm, I'm with Zach. I mean, I, this is uh, you know, if you were to put a gun to my head, what what's in the top 5 best American made movies? This is definitely in there and Yeah it's in some cases not even close. Like I know everybody wants to pump Kane's tires and I know Borif and I's favorite, uh, favorite chore is, is discussing citizen Kane. So I will, I'll spare him a little bit more of that. But I mean, if you're talking I about, I think it would be fun idea, to run the newspaper. I know, newspaper, I know, buddy. I know. Newspaper. <laughs> yeah. But if you're talking about, that musical will happen. if you're talking about the, the trail of dreams leading to broken hearts, uh, this movie does it a lot better i think stewart's a more convincing human than wells is as charles foster kane but that's not really what wells was going for in charles foster kane i understand they're two fucking different movies but considering like you said that there are similarities both had sort of a weird childhood trauma that they can't get over um they're both about wealth and materialism like if i'm gonna stack these two against each other it's what if a life wins by a mile and it's not even close and I think a couple things yeah. that I really love about this movie also. Um, one, this is just a simple thing. I actually kind of love the choice for these characters as this, this story takes place over like 15, tw excluding the childhood parts, 15 to 20 years, including up it's like 30. I love how they just don't age up. The characters are the fucking same age the whole time. Mr. Gower how, looks like fucking Mr. Potter? Gower. Mr. Gower at the beginning of the movie looks like he's a billion years old and he's still right. a fucking live at the end. That's my right. Man. <laughs> and how old is Potter? He's old man Potter when, when George is a kid. When George is mm -hmm. a kid. And he's yeah. still kicking. And I actually, it's, I think it, it works. Like, it just works. Like, it doesn't I mean, it right. feels, when it feels like a time. Yeah, it feels like the movie Our Town. It, or the, excuse me, it feels like the play Our Town where these characters aren't really yeah. who they are. They're an archetypal sense of it. Um, yeah. yeah, it's also funny because this movie I, is very, very much like it, it's it, the weirdest part about this movie is that the things that beset him are consistently like kill your dreams, <laughs> deal with what's happening around you, because it's like it's like the no exit thing, like hell is other people for this <laughs> guy, because every time he does anything in life, he's more tied into that community and that town and the people around him that he loves. So he's never going to leave there. And at the end, when he finally gets what he wants, it's to uh, just be a bank manager. So he's sort of come around to being like, this is what I want out of life. I don't want to leave. It's this is who I want to be. It's, it's, I, it's, right. it's, not it's to be because a it's a wonderful he, life. He still doesn't want to be a bank manager. He wants to make people's lives better. And he realizes he has done that in a substantial way. Like bank manager is the means for him to do it. It's not really what he wants to do. I think even at the end of the movie, he probably doesn't really enjoy that, but he enjoys the effect that it has on his community and his friends. Um, that but that I'll makes say, sense. I give you a point if I had one, because it's much more satisfying in this movie <laughs> than it is at the end of uh, Saving Private Ryan when the guy's just like 
did I do enough? And you're like, no, Matt Damon, go back to World War II. Yeah, I think this movie also does a pretty strong job of, you know, introducing quite a lot of characters pretty quickly and making them at least somewhat likable. There's like a full town here. And when the people show up at the end, like, you know who these characters are. And sometimes just their reaction is so like even the guy who's like got the warrant and tears it up the way he starts smiling and then bellowing old Lang Syne. I fucking love that part. The bank inspector <laughs> donates to the kitty. You know, he's yeah. just like, here you go. Oh, Lang Syne. Yeah. Uh, and I also, also and I, I mean, obviously, I think the no man is a failure who has friends. I love that uh, line. Yeah, I think that's a great little sentiment. I I, I think one of the sentiments that it's not even a line in the movie. It's a it's a little knitted thing underneath the picture of George Bailey's dad, and it says, "All you can take with you is what you give away." Yeah, um, that's awesome. I think that's 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 great. I, it gives me chills just thinking about that sentiment, and that's a nice sentiment to sort of like build on. And that's and and yeah, it does kind of rely on these sort of small town tropes. And and I think the purpose of that is the little trick they do at the end of showing you this alternate reality of Pottersville, mm -hmm. um, because you have you you know that they're your neighbors. I, I think the other thing that helps this movie, despite being old, is and Annie flirts with this line, but I don't think she ever crosses it. It ages pretty well. Like even though Annie is obviously like kind of a she's a stereotype for sure. But the movie likes Annie a fucking lot, and so do the characters. Like, they make it clear in that regard. And I think she flirts with the line, but it's never to the point where, like, some old movies are so fucking racist. Yeah. And it's not really a problem very much for this movie. Sure. I mean, you yeah. can say that there sure are a lot of white people in this town. Yeah, there sure know, are. Like, and, you know, that's, yeah. you know, it's a 1946 yeah, it, it, movie. It's Hollywood, it baby, a, in 1940. It is, it is a little strange when the... Uh, the house cook is a little sa a little sassy. That's a little bit of a trope, but yeah. it was like, all right, this I get yeah. it. Yeah. We're gonna get through this. We'll it, it for forty six things happen in the movie. It yeah, for yeah. forty six. For forty six, yeah. Annie being a beloved member of the family that they respect as a human being yes. is pretty good for nineteen forty six. Correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to keep her around? She's so sassy. Yeah. Um, I had this movie ruined for me by Goonies like the ending because oh, yeah? it's like I the thing is is I hadn't seen this movie and I hadn't I I wasn't against seeing it it was just that I saw the Goonies first and just like I saw the Ghostbusters cartoon as a kid and it ruined Citizen Kane because they had a whole bit about the sled <laughs> this one had a That's whole what bit did it, the, huh? well it was the whole bit at the end where they were like uh, the whole gag in Goonies was the parents were going to lose their house because they didn't have enough money so when the kids steal all the gems they get enough money to pay off the bank manager, and then there's this whole scene about it wasn't really the money. I always had a family who loved me, and that was the best gift of all. And I have a vague memory of like someone in my family going, "That's the uh, it's a wonderful life ending." They did the they ripped that off, and that was the only comment they had about Goonies. I I will <laughs> say was... I I saw I. I'm kind of with Zach. I, I kind of watched it once when I was a little kid and I sort of like, mm -hmm. well, no big deal. It's in black and white. Uh, you know, like I, I kind of did the typical kid thing. Um, and then I remember as, when it was in color. As, uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, the <laughs> um, then then I watched it like I think I, it was in high school or something. And my parents are kind of rented a bunch of movies. And one of them was the ref. Um, and there, if you've ever seen the ref, there's a whole gag where they actually record some important evidence and with a section of it's a wonderful life. And then I remember like, I don't remember that part of the movie. And then my dad's like, Oh, it's like one of the best parts of the movie. Cause it's the phone scene. That's that, that Zach, uh, that, I think right. the, the word yeah. I should have said was romantic tension. Yeah. I, I, oh, okay. I would say that too, but there's also a lot of, there's also a lot of George Bailey kind of like stuck again you know because it's after the news that you know my little brother is supposed to come back take over the job for me i'm gonna finally live my dream oh no he got married now i'm stuck here in bedford falls and i'm gonna go visit my old friend barry and and i know i really want to spend my life with her but i i know that she's gonna keep me tied down to this fucking yeah. town and then she really i he realizes it's worth it to him to be with her to be stuck in this town um, and then that's when the end of the movie happens where the rest of it goes out. But anyway, 
uh, I didn't realize that how how much of a charge scene that was with Donna Reed and and Jimmy Stewart. I mean, because Jimmy Stewart's very pensive and pissed off through most of it. He's kind of you know dismissive of of everything. Doesn't even care about the song and all the lengths. I, I I mean, Donna Reed is one of the most romantic significant others I think I've ever seen in my life. I mean, good lord, the gestures that she the overtures that she makes is is. I mean, I knock me over with a feather, lady. Um, you know, I'm I'm wooed. <laughs> You know, but consider I mean, I me taken. Their banter, like earlier in the movie with the lasso of the moon, it's 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 top tier romantic banter. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, what I and then the naked bush thing is is funny at least. At least it's not. It, you there's there's a point in your brain where you think this can go pretty bad of being like kind of creepy, but you know where he's just kind of teasing her like, you know, <laughs> what a shitty situation you're in. That's that's pretty funny. Yeah, I mean, that's also, yeah, like, that particular gag was that. played... That gag was used later in films that are way more uncomfortable. Like, if someone's, for instance, yeah. coming out of a shower and someone's holding a towel, that happened a lot in 80s, like, sex comedies, and it was never funny, but it was in a comedy. So it was always, like, this creepy, like, oh, just hand her the towel, don't be a dick, and... Yeah, you they mean always the movie that Porky's because that, that's all yeah. that fucking movie. Is. Well, there's right. that, but it was always that thing uh, where they thought it was like a fun, like romantic uh, thing. But in this one, like I like the romance as it was shown. It wasn't like them doing anything special. It's them about, walking I, home. I, I, did you guys? Did you guys find it interesting that? Okay, so everybody in Bedford Falls loves George Bailey. Everybody loves him, with the exception of Mrs. Hatch, of Mary's mother, for some reason. Like, just cannot stand George Bailey. George Bailey, you're no good. Get out of my house. Well, I think um, it's because, uh, I think there's a couple. So, obviously, Mr. Potter doesn't like him either. But Oh, okay. Uh, well, yeah, Mr. Potter, too. But um, I think it's because she's trying to push Mary to be with Sam Wainwright because Sam Wainwright is rich as fuck. I think Miss Hatch wants that money. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, well, right. She probably I wanted her daughter to be like set up with a nice guy where she knew she wouldn't have to worry about her daughter ever again. And instead she got with George Bailey. So she's happy, but she's got to worry about her daughter constantly. Like, I mean, the guy almost went to jail yeah. last year because of losing $8,000. Because <laughs> his a, he's uncle can't tell which newspaper he's fucking holding. <laughs> no nepotism at the office. I, That's horrible. Yeah. Right. Um, well, I did want to bring up one other thing. Um, is I, I well no because we kind of already talked about that. Um, I, I guess we could because we're we we've got a lot of business to get to. So uh, I guess sure. we're well, let, move me, on let me let me let me let me get you a couple Zach. couple final bits of trivia here. Then, okay. um, all right. First of all, Chris, I'm sure you noticed the cop named Bert, the tech, the yes. driver named Ernie. According Bert to Sesame Ernie. Street, that's a coincidence. I don't know if I believe them, but they claim that that's a complete coincidence. I mean, legally, um, Jim they Henson have to say literally that. I said, "I don't remember." Oh, Jim Henson okay. literally said, "I don't remember." <laughs> there, yeah, it seems like at the very least, it was a subconscious uh, influence. That's not um, a no. You'll notice. <laughs> I do deeply enjoy um, Chris. I'm sure Russell knows this. Chris, you might have missed this. Uh, the re- the renewal post that keeps coming loose. Uh, one of That's my favorite right. subtle gags in Christmas Vacation is that he has a <laughs> new the new post. Newel post. That he, yeah, <laughs> which is definitely a reference to this film. Um, and finally, this one's uh, this one's fun. This one. Uh, so Uncle Billy has a raven, and that raven is played by none other than Jimmy the Crow, who is in at least twenty eight movies, but possibly a few hundred during his tenure as a Hollywood crow. Uh, he he understood, according to his trainer, like about two hundred and fifty words about only 50 of which he called useful. It was just a crow this guy found in 1938. He's in uh, he's in The Wizard of Oz. He is the crow that lands on the scarecrow in Wizard of Oz. Same fucking Holy crow. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow, prolific. I mean, uh, crows was, are pretty smart. He was so popular. Um, Jimmy Stewart, the, Jimmy Stewart said of Jimmy the crow, when they called Jimmy, we both answered. And that he was the smartest actor on set, um, which is just a cute thing. Um, but yeah, he was insured for ten thousand dollars, which is a lot of money back in those days, as we just talked about. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> he had stand-ins uh, for scenes what? where he didn't have to do tricks. 
Wow, uh, dude, that crow's got crow. a killer agent. That, his that crow's foot, agent is something else. His footprints were enshrined in cement alongside Lassie's uh, at the uh, at this pet store in Los Angeles. Um, he was definitely alive from at least 1938 to 1954, but nobody knows exactly when he died. His owner um, died in 1956 at the age of 60. But what happened to Jimmy the Crow? is unknown uh, exactly where uh, he, he stopped being in movies in 1954, but if you can, you can find out more about Jimmy, the crow on our new podcast. What the fuck happened to that crow (laughs) Crow coming soon on audible (laughs) in captivity. They can live up to up to 40 years. So he could have lived up through about 78 or so. Yeah. Well, let's pour one out for Jimmy, the crow guys. Yeah. You know, it's very entertaining. Made the movie. Made the movie. Um, yeah. And props yeah, to that it, squirrel. It, that, that squirrel who ran up on his... I'll bet that was an accident. <laughs> but. <laughs> I, 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 did, I, I thought having the crow around the bank was very cool and ominous. You know, it's, it's, it's a... Capra kind of, put him in all of his movies after he first saw him. Every Capra movie he made after uh, whatever the first one he made with him was, which I think was maybe You Can't Take It With You. Yeah, um, after 38, uh, with he, he put him in every single movie he made uh, after that through the 50s. The guy who owned him said he could probably perform any task about as well as an eight-year-old child. Tricks that he could do included uh, typing, opening letters, and riding a tiny motorcycle. One week to learn a new word, two weeks if it was two syllables. (laughs) Oh, my God. Or if I'm actually, why don't you give us your final thoughts? This is your movie, and, uh, you know, like, we've been kind of, Zach and I have kind of uh, teased you a bit for not having to see it, so I'm curious. When you come into movies like this, where people have told me I need to see it, or where it's a cultural phenomenon, it's very hard to go into those and have a fresh experience, because you've either seen references to it, you've seen gags based off of it, it's been spoiled for you, somebody has like dressed up as a character and you have no reference for why they're dressed weird, and all sorts of things like that happen. So, seeing it, uh, I was worried um, that it, wouldn't, it would have a lot to overcome with that baggage, it's actually a very nice, sweet film. Like, I can understand why people became in love with Jimmy Stewart. I can understand why this would have been a film that people wanted to return to eventually. Um, I really liked some of the bits that were a little uh, darker than what I would have anticipated being in a movie like this. Because there's a whole scene in which the the um, shop owner almost poisons a child. And then um, uh, little uh, the, the, the main guy, um, George Bailey. George Bailey, sorry, just like I got stuck on his name, but George Bailey, like as a child, getting life tips to go talk to dad from cigarette ads and things like that uh, really entertained me uh, out of context. So I think I really enjoyed the movie because it's like there's plenty of stuff there that's like a good storytelling thing and just enough stuff there that's weird culturally to make it something I'd want to come back and like, you know, watch more. And, you know, it's now something where I can say, yeah, I've seen it. So people will stop bullying me in the streets and going, you know, why do you hate George Bailey? (laughs) You know, (laughs) or on podcasts where people ask me, why do you hate George Bailey? And I don't I don't know who George Bailey is because I haven't seen the movie and I have no reference for the character. So now what do you think of George Bailey? I think he's fine. He's fine. I mean, he probably should have followed his dreams more. He got pretty hard into the raising a family when he was too young. I, I mean, I, I love this movie. It, it, it's, I mean, well, how could you not? It's, it's, um, it, it's all of the, the darkness is revealed through these kind of soulful, emotive scenes and dialogue. There's not a lot of like action necessarily, but it, there's a lot of conflict. And I think it works because Jimmy Stewart and Frank Capra sort of understood the mindset of what they wanted this movie to sort of be. Um, and yeah, it, it's kind of, it, it, we're, we'll talk about it later, but I, I think it's kind of funny. It, like when we did rear window, this is one of those movies where you like, what, what can honestly be said about this movie that hasn't been said a thousand fucking times? Um, because even though it's, it had a rebirth in the American zeitgeist in the seventies, um, it's so, ingrained into i mean and that's why i kind of picked this this theme because a lot of these movies you already have these if not vague references you have exact precise references of what it is referring to um and and in this movie i was hoping that more of coming into a blind would 
you know, and I, I think he kind of did that, that what dreams can do to broken hearts and that that usually just ends in a veil of tears. Um, and yeah, the, the sort of magical happy ending of everything. Uh, it, it, it's a bit jarring, but it's motivated and earned. So it doesn't really bother me all that much. Uh, but I could see how it could. I, I, I honestly could, where it does kind of change the whole movie. Um, but it's fine. Uh, I, I, if you haven't seen this movie, if you're like Boraf and you've been kind of sleeping on it, you don't have to watch it now, you know, in, in, in you know, mid spring, but you know, next holiday season, do sit down and watch this movie. Cause you will be rewarded and do watch the fucking black and white version. Don't watch yeah. the color. Do not shit. watch the color yeah. version, please. Yeah. And, and if uh, you're hearing this out of context of time, we're nowhere near Christmas right now. Like this was a, a coal. This is we a won't be hot this, weather. This pick. should come out. This should come out around June 11th. Yeah. So, yeah. Just what everybody wants to see. <laughs> a, 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 a jaunty Christmas movie in the heart of June. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, so I also love this movie. As I said, it is one of my full stop favorite movies. Uh, I think it's great. I think that uh, it is truly, like I mentioned at the beginning, that uh, it has DNA like from from A Christmas Carol, and you can feel that. I think that the strengths of the two are similar in many ways. I think they are still the two definitive Christmas movies, even though I think both of them are actually pretty good at not being overly bogged down in modern at least modern, but overall Christmas symbology. Like this has angels in it, but it's not too much about Jesus. It's not like talking about Jesus left, right and center. It's they, they're functionally the angel is as, as the same function as the ghosts in the Christmas care. Um, and I think it works better that like, it doesn't get fucking doesn't spray you down with a fucking Christmas hose. I think the, I think the message in both is like among the strongest. So many Christmas movies are cheap. Uh, their messages are stupid, confusing, simplistic, don't pay off. They don't go dark enough to actually land. Um, and I think that that like, uh, you know, is, is very much to the benefit of, of this film, but unlike a Christmas Carol, which I don't think has a definitive version, in film, I'm sure the novel was technically a definitive version. There is only one. It's a wonderful life. And this is it. Um, yeah, I think it, it it is the best Christmas movie. It is one of the best movies around, in my opinion. Its only flaw is I, I have now learned that they had a crow who was capable of riding a tiny motorcycle and did not include a scene where a crow <laughs> rides a tiny motorcycle. You're yeah, sitting on a gold they mine. Just, yeah, they should have just cut that in when he comes back and everything in Bedford Falls is all terrible. It's Pottersville. They should have <laughs> yeah, just no, had no, the no. crow Here's with like a leather jacket, like <laughs> oh, smoking yeah, and driving. <laughs> and being like, we're going Get out of here, Disneyland. square. <laughs> Yeah. I was going to say, I thought you were going to, my, my take was going to be, um, was going to be, you know, George, we saved a ton of money when we combined the gym, the pool and the crow motorcycle track into one building. <laughs> um, that was you know, a you know global what? sensation. <laughs> it's, it's the season of giving Chris. You, you, you picked one of, one of my favorite movies. You get my last point. I don't want to walk away miserly holding my points back, you know, you can only you, the only thing you could take with you, Zach, is what you give away. Yeah. All right, Chris Boref, for Goodwill Hunting, what do you got? I didn't like them apples. I'm giving it a two. <laughs> okay. Uh, Boref gives it a two. I also have to give Goodwill Hunting a two. I didn't despise it as much as Boref did, but there's just better movies on the docket. Uh, I, I gave it a, a four, you know, it's fine. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty, there's, there's good stuff in it. Robin Williams is, it's, I like him. Sure. All right. So that puts Goodwill well, Hunting at it twice eight. as much as we did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. All righty. Uh, Chris Boref, say anything, say your score. I gave say anything a five. I, that shocks me. That, that's that's surprising. Uh, I gave Say Anything a three. I also gave Say Anything a three. Okay, so Goodwill Hunting is out. 
what will we happen? Are, <laughs> I wonder. It's a total mystery. Uh, so that puts Say Anything at 11 points. So 11 points to win. Chris Boroff, It's a Wonderful Life. What do you got? It's a Wonderful Seven is what I gave. It's a Wonderful Life. All right. Seven. That already. Well, we're already going to hammer it home because I gave It's a Wonderful Life a six. And I gave It's a Wonderful Life a seven. So okay. that is, I think, the biggest sweep we've had on this show. Mm-hmm. 20 points. I would say so. That was pretty, uh, pretty decisive win. Wow. I would have given more points. Actually, this is the first time. This has got to be the first time that the winning movie had more than the other two combined, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's that true. Looks about right, but we do have an we do have an odd number of points to allocate three and then ten. But anyway, um, so uh, Chris Porath, you have done it. You have won the movie trap. Um, I guess real quick, what what theme uh, do you have? Uh, do you have for us? Well, big guy? I'll talk to you about the movie that gave me this idea. See, I was watching It's a Wonderful Life, and um, I noticed that. It got a lot of Academy Award nominations, but didn't get any of them. So it got me asking what other films... a technical award. Yeah, well, it got me asking what other films have been, like, hard shut out in that same way where they were up for that much. Um, One of the ones that I had an example of was Master and Commander, because Mm. it was up for, like, ten, and then got locked out for all of them because of the Lord of the Rings, the Twin Towers, or the Two Towers. Not the Twin Towers. Um, so, uh, that got me asking, I think, like, I think in Return general, of the King was the one that swept all the Oscars. Th- that was it. Yeah. But it got me asking about failed franchises, because that was a failed franchise. They attempted to make a whole hmm. series of Master and Commander films. Right. Because there's a bunch of books. But they never got to make any after the first one, because the first one came out. It was fine. It wasn't passionately accepted or anything like that. So the idea of failed franchises was in mind. And I decided maybe we should watch The Mummy. Tom okay. Cruise's The Mummy. Tom Cruise or <laughs> Brendan Fraser? <laughs> no, no. The, the Brendan Fraser Tom one Cruise. had sequels. That's a successful franchise. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because, you see, the whole thing is, is it's either they spend enough money that it has to be a franchise, or it gives the suggestion of an obvious sequel. So I think that one fits both. And I'm going to put it out there. I, I picked uh, The Mummy because it seems like it could be fun versus being a good movie. Uh, because I have okay. a feeling Master and Commander would be a good movie, but maybe not fun. So there's hoping. But so, so failed franchises is the criteria. Failed franchises. Yes. Okay. All right. That should be fun. I mean, it, it, it does leap because there's a lot of dreck that came uh-huh. out that was intended yep. to be like a, you know, like so. Remo you're, you're Williams, the adventure begins. Some pain, buddy. Yeah, you're setting yourself up for oh, some there's, pain. There's, I mean, if you look, I'm sure there's one or two examples where the movie was good, but people just didn't connect with it. Eddie and the Cruisers. Yeah. But yeah. that was a successful franchise because they had two of them. <laughs> Angels Revenge, Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's all because there's all sorts of like knockoff TV shows that like tried to make a movie. Oh yeah, based off a TV show. Yeah. So specific, what the question like, is, what do you think is the best one? Do you think it's fun or do you think it's a good movie? And you got to pick uh, one out and let uh, me we'll, know. We'll have to find out because I mean I'm gonna have to sit through a Tom Cruise movie, so we'll we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, but the we did want to mention, ladies movies, and gentlemen. Yeah. Right. Oh boy. Uh, anyway, so uh, I don't know. If, I don't know if you of home have noticed, but this episode in particular would mark our full year yeah. of doing this, this is podcast. Our twenty sixth film. Uh, we do one every other week. It comes to fifty two weeks. Technically, the next episode will be like the actual anniversary, but this is a year of films right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I just want to say that I've had a ball doing this podcast back with you folks. It's been great because I, I, you know, we're all so busy most of the time nowadays. And especially when we are in the pandemic, you know, it's fun to have to watch. I like things that are curated for me, movies and shit that are curated for me. If, if it left to my own devices, I'm just going to keep watching the same shit I always watch. Um, so that's why I liked doing the film yeah. concussion back then. So I like doing mm-hmm. this with you lot. 
because A, we've turned into a fun little game and it lets us just kind of be wild with it. And and it's it's a lot of fun. So I just want to thank you guys uh, for jumping on again. It's been a blast. I completely agree. I think that uh, it's great to have an excuse to watch something you wouldn't normally watch because especially in my life, it does tend to be the fact that I don't like I, I don't tend to seek out new movies a lot of the time because it's just too much hassle. So to have an excuse to like be forced to do that an additional little bonus as of the recording of this um we are in april of 2021 and april of 2011 was the first time i ever spoke with chris on our old podcast the film concussion <laughs> when i guest starred talking about the fantastic four the chris evans one and batman mm-hmm. forever and that it was while i was in new york um it was the week after I, I, I came there the week after Game of Thrones started or maybe two weeks and I left the day before Osama Bin Laden got got. So it was <laughs> right in late April of uh, 2011. So it's 10 years of, uh, of friendship with Chris and longer with Russell. Wow. Mm-hmm. That, that, that is wild. It's that, been that great. That Borf and I even just had this kind of like harebrained scheme of him and I just bullshitting about movies 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, it was because of uh, college. Like, we were all in college together having to do Ma- Howie Boschewitz, like, the sound of cinema class. It was us <laughs> going outside because I didn't want to spend more time with Howie. And if you're outside, like, you know, Russell's there smoking five packs of cigarettes Indeed. in five yeah. minutes. <laughs> and it's just a thing where it's like you either try to keep up with them in conversation or just listen to, like, the, the, the nicotine make his little, like, you know, drum go crazy. Watch my so, eye yeah. twitch. Dad, yeah. Watch Tokyo Story again. Yeah, um, but I've I've loved this. I I've loved being able to come back and do the podcast again because it's a conversation that felt like I it had dropped off. Like twelve, like in 2012, when I got too busy to have fun or have an enjoyable time chatting with people or watching things, and then the you know uh, the whole world went on pause, and then everything had to kind of get reorganized. So we've had a yeah, great we time. We are definitely a child of the pandemic. Yeah. This podcast. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes. And and. and 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 it's it, and it's been fun, kind of just kind of letting it organically grow. We we, you know, when you go back to the very first, also Jimmy Stewart classic of Rear Window, uh, <laughs> we've, we've managed to bookend a year of of, of Jimmy yeah, Stewart classic. It's the annual Jimmy Stewart episode. There's gonna be pressure. Right. <laughs> so so next year next year we're gonna we're committed to Harvey. That's what we're yeah. gonna watch the the Harvey movie. Um, oh, I was thinking Arsenic I and ask, Old Lace. Is that him? Ooh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to, no, no. It's called Northside Seven Seven Seven. Um, Cary Grant, I believe. Uh, okay. Anatomy of a Murder. Um, I could go on and on. But, like, yeah. so I wanted to ask you guys, considering it's been a year, do you guys have a favorite movie well, that let's we've go watched through this. so far? I'm going to list some of these, because i got a list of these movies, and the, the listener might want to know what the options are without having to go through their feed, okay? So okay. I'm just going to go through our themes and uh, the movies they're in. Our first theme ever was isolation, because, well, we were self isolating And the picks there were my pick of Rear Window, Russell brought us The Lighthouse, and Chris brought us Color Out of Space. Rear <laughs> Window won the round. Mm-hmm. The next pick, A Cab or Bad Cops. Um, uh, in that particular round, I gave us Blind Spotting. Uh, Russell, or Chris gave us The Stanford Prison Experiment, and Russell gave us Police Academy. Uh, Chris's pick of Stanford Prison Experiment won. We also did an interview. Um, uh, yeah, we had uh, Tim in Talbot on. week uh, with the screenwriter. Mm-hmm. That's right. Uh, then we took a break to do our Halloween segment. It was uh, Halloween movies from, I believe, 1960 to 1979. Horror movies, that is. Um, and for that series, uh, Russell gave us Phantasm. I gave us Don't Look Now. And Chris gave us the winner, The Wicker Man. And as a result, he got to pick whatever movie he wanted. He gave us Border for his bonus movie. (laughs) Uh, Then we moved on to political thrillers. Political thrillers. Chris gave us the Parallax View. Russell gave us All the King's Men. And I gave us The Death of Stalin. Death of Stalin won, but that's the closest to a tie we've ever had between All the King's Men and Death of Stalin. It was a tie for a moment. That yeah, was reallocated. Yeah, that's right. And then we had a tie later on. Yeah, uh, dual roles, <laughs> um, actors in more than one role. I gave us Dead Ringers, uh, and then uh, Chris went ahead and gave us Enemy. Russell with the Ringer and Doctor Strange Love won the round. Uh, 
that led to the controversial peck and paw round, <laughs> in which Russell gave us the wild bunch. Uh, I gave us Spring as the head of Alfredo Garcia, which won. Uh, Chris gave us Iron Cross. Barely that brought won. us to significant others picking. Uh, for that, I gave a Bugsy Malone, or I should say Shannon did. Um, and then uh, Borif Sarah gave us Communion. Uh, and Russell Sarah gave us 9 to 5, the winner of the round. And that brings us to this round, Unseen Ubiquitous. Of course, Goodwill Hunting say anything from me. Goodwill Hunting from Russell and Chris winning with It's a Wonderful Life. And His own also, ringer. His own ringer. Should, <laughs> that's a ringer. And we'd be remiss uh -huh. not to mention the Christmas bonus episode, which ah, Russell Christmas won vacation. and yeah. gave us Crystal's Vacation. So here's the standings, just in case you were curious. Chris has won three rounds, including the Halloween bonus. Russell? has won two and the Xmas pick. Uh, and we tied on that one round, and I have won three. So we're pretty goddamn close, all things considered. Yeah, that's actually Not way more shabby. balanced out year than I thought it was going to be. I, I assumed one person was going to sweep it, but no, it seems like it's been pretty balanced. And, and I'll, I'll take the 2.5, you know. We'll yeah. call the, the Christmas <laughs> thing a, a point five, a half a point, a half a win. <laughs> but no, do you guys, so I, I just real quick, before we before we run out of time, because this has already been a super size anniversary episode, um, do you guys have a favorite that you've watched so far? Because I know mine. My favorite's Blind Spotting. That's the favorite one I've watched so far. Mm. Um, uh... I mean, this is of the movies we've watched. It's a Wonderful Life is is the best one. Okay. Like it's my favorite of the list. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of feel a little torn because it's a film that I already knew about, but like The Wicker Man because it's uh, my favorite. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah, it's my wife's favorite, so it was just an easy pick. Okay. What What about a least favorite? Do you have a least favorite? Because mine's Iron mine's Cross. A, really, Cross of Iron. But mine's got to be yeah. enemy, big guy. Mine's got to be enemy. I, yeah, uh, yeah. For me, it's going to ultimately come down to either enemy or police academy. Okay, right, right. Yeah, police um, academy. But it was fun to talk about, at least. It was fun to talk about. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a tough, it's really uh, a coin flip. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for me, I just remembered like Iron Cross of Iron simply because I I had my expectations high, and then it was like, no, no, this is going to be the same thing you saw last week with the older coat of paint. It was you know, not. It, it was it, not a great movie. I mean, you'd you'd watch two at that point, buddy. I mean, you know, yeah. two two's kind of a pattern at least. Uh, I yeah, mean, I, I don't know what surprised you. Um, so I, and then I, my go ahead. But, well, so the then the next one, what one, what movie that we've watched has surprised you the most? What movie did you watch that said like, oh, this was not what I was expecting? Um, yeah. and, and I'm gonna go for me, Dead Ringer. I mean, Dead Ringers, because I I thought that that movie was gonna be something completely different, and uh, it, it was not. That that that, that movie got. To Oh, I have two. One surprised me in a good way because I just didn't know what to expect, and I ended up really liking it. It was one of my favorites also of the year, and that's Blind Spotting. Um, it's interesting that both of us liked that movie so much, and it still lost the round. Um, uh, but um, and uh, I have, and the other one is is Border because that movie was fucking weird. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and I didn't know what to expect going in, and it, it, it certainly wasn't that. Um, <laughs> I'll also say, if I have a regret, I think that, you know what, Russell, I do think all the King's Men should have beaten the death of Stalin, because I think about it quite a bit still. I think that was one of the quali one of, uh, a quality movies. Yeah. Year. I would say that's mine for, like, the one that was the most revelatory was All the King's Men, because I hadn't seen it before, and it I didn't have any context for it, and I think that the other film that's about the JFK assassination, or excuse me, the, the uh, not JFK assassination, the, uh, uh, RFK, the movie. RFK, but close enough. Assassination RFK. in general. Yeah. Um... They were both kind of interesting, uh, but yeah, this or, it was definitely all. It was the Huey Kings Long, met. wasn't it? Huey Long was who all the King's yeah. Men was based on. Yeah. yeah, sorry, uh, I think I was getting it confused with the old old movie about Nixon. That's the one I meant to say. Yeah, um, I mean, it would have been hard for all, all the King. Uh, that's all the presidents met. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, trim this bit out because it was King's plainly Men's me just having a grandpa moment of forgetting all the presidents met. <laughs> yeah. 
a- another movie you haven't seen. It would have been difficult um, for all the King's Men to be about the JFK or RFK assassinations because they had not happened yet. That, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> we're t- this thing came out in 39, for God's sakes. Yeah. Um, all yeah. right. Well, uh, I guess that's that's as good a time as any to uh, wrap things up for our super, super size episode of an anniversary episode. Uh, join us next time for a brand spanking new round of the movie trap with failed Fritz, franchises. Failed franchises. And we will be watching Tom Cruise's version of The Mummy. Uh, can't wait. So uh, with that in mind, gentlemen, uh, it's been great. I've been Russell Carlson. I have been Zach Powers. I've been Chris Boroff. Have a great day. And as we always say here on the Movie Trap, Diane Ladd is too young to be Chevy Chase's mom. That's the Movie Trap promise. George, Sam wants to speak to you. Hi, Sam. Well, George Bailiofsky. Hey, a fine pal you are. What are you trying to do, steal my girl? Oh, what do you mean? Nobody's trying to steal anybody's girl. Here, here, here here's Marion. Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to talk to here, you. Tell Mary to get on the extension. You talk. But it's on the extension. We can... I am not. We can both hear. Come here. We're, we're listening, Sam. Well, look, I have a big deal coming up that's going to make us all rich. George. Do you remember that night in Martini's bar when uh, you told me you'd read some place about making plastics out of soybean? Chili beans. You remember out of chili, out of soybean. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 soybean, yeah. Well, listen, Dad snapped up the idea and he's going to build a factory outside of Rochester. How do you like that? Rochester? Well, why Rochester? Well, why not? Can you think of anything better? Well, I don't know. Just why not right here? You remember that uh, that old tool and machinery works? We, you tell your father you can get that for a song and all the labor he wants too. Half the town was thrown out of work when they closed down. That's so. Well, I'll tell him. Hey, that sounds great. Ah, oh, baby, I knew you'd come through. Now, here's the point, Mary. Mary, you're in on this too. Now listen. Have you got any money? Money? Yeah. Well, a little. I want you to put every cent you've got into our stock, do you hear? And George, I may have a job for you. That is, unless you're still married to that broken down building and loan. (laughs) Well, this is the biggest thing since radio, and I'm letting you in on the ground floor. Oh, Mary. Mary. Well, uh, uh, I'm here. Uh, will you tell that guy I'm giving him the chance of a lifetime, do you hear? The chance of a lifetime. He says it's the chance of a lifetime. Now, you listen to me. I don't want any plastics, and I don't want any ground floors, and I don't want to get married ever to anyone. You understand that? I want to do what I want to do. And you're... And you're... Oh, Mary. George, George, George.